I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about one of the best new books out there right now in national security, we have with us Tom Shanker, former reporter and editor of the New York Times at the Washington Bureau and many other places. Tom is also the co-author, you will remember, of the New York Times bestseller, Counter-Strike, The Untold Story of America's Secret Campaign Against Al-Qaeda. But Tom is here to talk about his new book. It's called Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats. Tom, you wrote this with Andrew Hone at RAND. So good to see you. And, you know, we've been friends a long time. I'm really excited to talk about this book. Well, it's an honor to be here. This is exactly the kind of forum that is important to getting important national security questions out to a general audience. It's too important to talk about just in Washington. So, Andrew, it's an honor to be here with somebody who is as fluent in national security as he is in rock and roll. So thank you. (laughs) We will get to the Grateful Dead in this podcast. I know we will. But before we do that, let's talk about why you wrote this book and what did you learn research and writing it? You know, what, what, what came to, you've been writing about national security for a long time, covering it. What's new in this book? Right. Thanks for that. So Andy Hone is the senior vice president for research and analysis at RAND. And so clearly he was the brains of the operation. And I've known him since he worked for Secretary Rumsfeld at the Pentagon. Right. For 9-11 and after. And we were good professional colleagues. We've become friends over the years. And we used to have dinner together at a Lebanese restaurant near the Pentagon just talking about what are the threats that we're not aware of. You know, before 9-11, there was certainly a cadre in government that knew who Osama bin Laden was. But after 9-11, people kept saying, why didn't we know? Well, who's the we and what's the no? Because there were people who'd spent their whole careers watching Osama bin Laden. So we started out talking about unknown threats and ticking time bombs. And very quickly, we realized that was too small a question. So we set for ourselves the assignment of redefining national security asking what national security should be. We realize that after 20 plus years, the Zoom-like focus on counterterrorism, of which I was a part as a New York Times Pentagon correspondent. Absolutely. My focus was Zoom-like on counterterrorism, that that 20 years of circling the strategic cul-de-sac of the Middle East let a lot of problems rise. China caught up with us militarily. Some say they've exceeded us. We ignored climate change. Climate security is national security. Food security. Think about on 9-11, 3,000 people died. Now, any death of above zero is a crime, but a million Americans died from COVID. And we never went on a war footing because nobody ever said pandemic is a national security problem. Right. We still don't, for instance, we had a 9-11 commission. We don't have a, a national bipartisan COVID commission. Exactly right. And so until we as a nation demand of our leaders to expand the definition of national security as defined only by things that we can kill or blow up to problems that threaten us as a people and might only be mitigated and managed and not defeated until we have this kind of conversation about what really is a national security risk. We are not going to be safe. Well, you came to the right place, of course, and we couldn't agree with you at CSIS more. We're studying global health uh, as a matter of national security, energy security, climate security. We're studying, you know, economic security. We're studying technology supremacy, renewing American innovation, things like that. What are some of the things, Tom, that you really honed in on in this book? It's a fascinating thesis. And I want to know what, what what really struck you as you went through this analysis? Sure. I mean, we can talk about great power rivals, China and Russia. And having spent five years in Moscow, the time my wife calls five winters, I'm kind of fixated on Putin because I met Putin before he was Putin. But everybody knows about those risks. So a couple that really struck me and informed me, um, the first is really food security traveled to Kansas State University, I've been in Iowa, where the farmers out there, you know, you think of the Midwest, the flyover country. These are extremely international and global people. They're doing soybean deals with China. They're doing grain deals with India. They understand the globe in ways that people on Capitol Hill and its state should take a lesson from. And no criticism of our political and diplomatic leaders, but they know 
that we could be just two or three harvests away from global starvation if a man-made or a natural occurring wheat blight happened. Cattle disease, livestock disease, and these things travel. And there's an example that just kind of blew my mind, Andrew. I guess wild rabbits are as populous in New Zealand as, as hobbits. And so a lot of farmers there petitioned the government to use a hemorrhaging virus to kill off the wild rabbit population that was eating their crops. The government said no. So one of them flew to the Czech Republic this is in the late 1990s, where this hemorrhaging virus was legal but controlled, bought it, put it on his handkerchief, flew back to New Zealand and infected the entire country's wild rabbit population. That's amazing. It's just that easy. And so I'm just deeply concerned. And there's a, a laboratory at Kansas State University called the National Bioagro Defense Facility. $1.2 billion of our tax money paid for it. Most people have never heard of it. And it's the only frontline defense against agri-bio risks. And the force behind it was a guy named Richard Myers, who you will recall was vice chairman on 9-11, became chairman for the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq. And he became fixated on food security because he was reading all the intel from the Al-Qaeda caves where they were experimenting with crop disease and animal disease. And thank goodness they never mastered it, but someday somebody could. And COVID would look like a minor cold compared to a global food pandemic. Well, and we're seeing echoes of food being used as a weapon, Vladimir Putin, and, you know, the pulling out of the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which we just did a podcast on last week. Uh, you know, you see it right there. I listened to that podcast. It was fantastic. I commend it to all of your listeners, but that's it exactly. So this food blight could be naturally occurring, or as you said, one man deviously cutting off grain supplies where? Not to the U.S. or Europe, but to Syria, Africa, populations that really need this wheat. And Vladimir Putin is saying, no wheat for you people. So, Tom, what do you think is going wrong with national security right now that we're not necessarily attuned to some of these kinds of threats? Right. A couple of things, Andrew. Thanks for asking. I'll get to the politics of it last. The real problem is that threats are coming at us faster. They're coming at us at the speed of the internet and AI. And kinetically as well, China's hypersonics is, is a threat that we simply have no defense against right now. So that's why we call it a new age of danger, because for the first time in our history, there are two countries that could wipe us off the face of the earth with nuclear weapons. That's never been that way before. And the threats are multiplying and coming faster. And then at the end of the day, and you've known me for a long time, the New York Times and now, just like you, I'm apolitical. I'm nonpartisan, just right. like CSIS. But I think we would both agree that if we're polarized, we're not safe. And I really do wish for a return to an era when the Democrats and the Republicans could disagree, but amicably. Disagree over principles. Sure, agree and to over, disagree. And over analysis and not over the, the partisan zero sum. I mean, it used to be everybody had to win a little bit and we were successful. Now it's not enough just for you to lose, but you have to go die, right? That's where our politics are today. And we are not safe. Believe me, Vladimir Putin loves our gridlock. The Chinese leadership loves our gridlock. Well, you know, it is hard to imagine. Our, as you know, our chairman emeritus is former United States Senator Sam Nunn, chairman of the Armed Services Committee. It's hard to imagine Nunn Luger and some of the great legislation that protected the United States and, and coming to fruition today with the politics we have. You just named two people who should be on the Mount Rushmore of bipartisan leadership. And I really do yearn for a return of people like that. So, Tom, what do we need to do to make our national security more effective, both in terms of cost, in terms of having the right weapons, in terms of identifying the right threats? Mm -hmm. So a lot of people, you know, Andy Hone is at RAND. I'm a former New York Times guy. We go out on speaking tours and discussions like this one, Andrew, and people think that we're going to be from the typical Beltway crowd who says, more money for defense. Okay, I think we should spend what's required, but we think that $1.2 trillion a year, which is the current budget for all of national security and intelligence, is plenty. We really, really do. It's a lot of money. It's a lot of money. It, it's real money, too. And so we think coming out of 20 years of focus on counterterrorism, we already are beginning to see 
some of that money spreading to where it should be. The Pentagon has a climate change plan, but a plan without a budget is a fantasy. So with all due respect to the Department of Defense, your climate adaptation plan is still a fantasy. But you're not putting money against it. There's no money to deal with Norfolk, the naval base, Coronado, being underwater in 30 years. Yeah. The Department of Defense is the world's largest consumer of fossil fuels. And as the air gets hotter and wetter, it requires more fuel to attain lift. And there are some early programs in synthetic fuels. has to be more money put against that. I would salute President Biden, even though I'm a nonpartisan person. I think his CHIPS Act is getting around very well. The problem of, you know, cyber and AI and all that without our own chip supply we won't be safe. But that's just a down payment. That's, that's not, there's no time for a victory lap yet. So we're talking about climate change and, you know, this summer with rains, with extreme heat, and this is not just the United States. Of course, it's global. Europe's been suffering, Asia, et cetera. What more can we be doing to raise awareness that the Pentagon needs a better plan on climate change, that Congress needs to take it more seriously? What do, what do we do? It's discussions exactly like this, discussions that try to, as your podcast does, get outside the beltway, because these are questions the American public should be discussing. I mean, I don't know anybody who's a credible climate change denier anymore, but there still isn't enough pressure on our government to embrace it as the national security threat that it is. And one of the problems, one of the major themes of our book is that politics always eats up all the bandwidth. And the future must have a seat at the table. No question. Speaking of the future, let's talk about AI. This is something we're thinking more and more about at CSIS. I've been doing a number of podcasts on it with my colleagues and with outside experts. What do you think about AI, especially as it relates to national security? Right. There are two themes of that. One is AI and weaponry. Now, I'm sure your listeners who are very well educated and follow national security will understand that there's already artificial intelligence on the battlefield. And I don't mean Terminator robots. The HIMARS air defense system that we sent to Ukraine, we the US, has artificial intelligence because when there's a missile incoming, I don't care how smart you are, with your iPhone or an abacus, you cannot track the trajectory in time. So HIMARS by itself, artificial intelligence, analyzes that trajectory and we hope knows an incoming missile from a airplane with civilians on board. So AI is already on the battlefield. The issue is with things like hypersonics that come too fast for us to be able to deal with, we humans. Threats on the web that come at network speeds. If we want to defend against network and hypersonic threats, we'll have to develop programs that can make decisions for us. So AI weapons, AI what else? Technology in terms of information? Here's the scary one. And if it wasn't in the book, I wouldn't talk about it because it keeps people awake at night. When you wed AI and the latest biological DNA research, it will not be impossible someday for a nefarious actor to create a very targeted virus for very targeted assassination. It could be against a leader or it could be targeted to the DNA of the leader's children. You could hold a leader hostage. You could create viruses that attack people by race, by those who carry the Tay-Sachs gene. Sure. And you know what that means? Yeah, Jews. Exactly right. Absolutely. And this is not, this is not science fiction. This is science approaching very quickly. And it's great that steps are being taken to start to put restrictions on AI. But when you wed supercomputers, AI, and advances in science, there are weapons out there, tiny, small, genetic, viral weapons that could be absolutely existential to us. So this is the idea that we need to be talking, even though this keeps us up, up at night, even though this is really scary stuff, and as, as you point out, it's not science fiction, this is the kind of stuff that we need to be talking about. It has to be part of our national debate, which again, I'm so honored to be here with someone like you who's raising these issues, not just in a coffee shop in Washington, but on a podcast that can be listened to everybody across our nation. The grimmest decision a democracy makes is going to war. We can't let those decisions be made only in the halls of Washington. And even short of going to war, how we define national security, how we earmark our dollars has to be part of a broader 
public debate. So really, Andrew, thank you so much for having this conversation and all the ones like it on your podcast. Tom, you know it's my pleasure. Um, another scary subject, and you mentioned this, nuclear weapons. You know, we've got a movie Oppenheimer out now. There's a lot of attention being paid to nuclear because of the conflict in Ukraine, because of some of, you know, our commitments. Where do you see nuclear threats going? And what should we be worried about? So Vladimir Putin and his cronies are already threatening tactical nukes in, in Ukraine. Fortunately, American intelligence has seen no signs that they're actually preparing to do that. But one thing we've learned about Putin, if he says something, we should take him seriously. His speech at the Munich Security Conference in 2007, he said he was going to invade Georgia. A year later, he invaded Georgia. In 2007, Putin said Ukraine is part of Russia. He invaded in 2014. He invaded last year. We need to listen to this guy. Does what he says. He does what he says. And these are not Kremlin moles or intercepts of, of Putin's cell phone. This is the man himself on a public stage. So we have to pay attention. I do think that nuclear arms control has been successful in the past. I think the Chinese are interested in nuclear stability. They want parity, but I think they want nuclear stability. And what I don't know, though, is whether arms control works in the area of AI and cyber, because it's not just state actors. And it's a whole new, new world. Speaking of China, what is your analysis about China in this book? There's so much to talk about when it comes to China. But what do you really think the threat is? The national defense strategy that was being prepared in 2001 before 9-11 named China as a major threat. 9-11 changed everything. And as we've talked about a few minutes ago, this entire country, the world, went on a seat, a counterterrorism zoom. And China used 20 years to, to catch up with us. So now it's too late. I think China also is interested in stability because the economics are important. China doesn't have allies. It has clients. It wants to keep those clients. Doesn't have a lot of friends in the world. Doesn't have a lot of friends. And we do. That said, Taiwan is a red line. It may not be rational to you or me or our listeners, but if Taiwan acts recklessly in moving toward independence, then I think Chinese leaders probably have to act for their own internal authority and legitimacy. And that scares me because we really cannot control the leadership of Taiwan. And I think that the time to have armed Taiwan with the kind of weapons it needs to defend itself was five years ago. So someone can build a time machine, I think we can get Taiwan prepared to deter. What we want is for China to have doubts that an invasion would work. That's the essence of, of deterrence. And I think it could be in a couple of years that China is pretty confident. And I wish that we had begun building doubt into China's thinking by arming Taiwan the way we're arming Ukraine today. But five years ago, anything we do now will be extremely provocative. Well, and it's going to be hard also, even financially for us, while we're our commitments to Ukraine, our commitments in other places in the world like Israel, how many more, you know, serious national security defense aid commitments can we make at that scale? That's exactly right. Taiwan's not a poor country. I mean, Ukraine didn't have the money, but Taiwan should be able to pay for a lot of this. The other challenge, and I don't mean to be sarcastic here, but there's no Poland next to Taiwan. So how we arm Taiwan is a completely different thing. And all those waters, China has overmatching capabilities. Tom, this is an awful lot to think about and some of it not so optimistic. What can you leave our listeners with? You know, because I know people who listen to this podcast are going to want to go out and get this book. What can you leave us with when you think about the future of the United States national security? Are, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? How do you feel? If I have any optimism, and we all should, it's that the quality of people in our government really is impressive. And that's why I hate sort of criticism of the deep state, and I don't like the polarization we have today. You know, I was a reporter in, in Moscow, and one of the Communist Party newspapers called me an enemy of the state. Okay, I got it. That was a communist dictatorship. I don't like it in America when an elected leader calls free media an enemy of, of the state. So I do think there are people in journalism, in the policy analysis world, like here at CSIS, at all of our institutions who are committed, hardworking people 
And for anybody listening to this podcast, this is the time to make sure that the leaders we put in office, the senior leaders running these hardworking, committed patriots are the best that we can do, like none, like, like Lugar. I'm apolitical. I'm nonpartisan. I'm not saying Democrat or Republican. Both parties have thoughtful leaders. Let's let them have a chance and take it out of the hands of those who live for polarization. The book is called Age of Danger, Keeping America Safe in an Era of New Superpowers, New Weapons, and New Threats by Tom Shanker and Andrew Hone. Tom, thank you so much for being here today. Andrew, it was an honor. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts. From Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 